Well, actually, I, will, I will second that one because I saw a totality in Australia in 2000. Anyway, we're, we're up to time, so better stop. <coughs> it's still 29 here, Terry. I was 30 now. Oh, is it right? My computer's <laughs> a little bit fast. Right. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome, and Happy New Year to everyone, of course. I'm still letting a few in here, but let's, let's do that now then. Um, okay. So our guest speaker tonight um, is... is uh, let me just change screens there. It is Professor Antonio Martin Carrillo, and he is from University College Dublin, where he's an Ad Astra Fellow and Assistant Professor in the School of Physics. He graduated with a BSc and MSc in Physics with Astronomy from the University uh, Comlutens in Madrid, and worked at the European Space Agency for two years as part of the XMM Newton Space Observatory Calibration Team. He moved to University College Dublin, where he completed his PhD investigating gamma ray bursts and pulsars. So I will, I'm going to mute everybody. And then the only person who's allowed to unmute themselves is Antonio. Um, and we will hand the floor over to him and he will share his screen. OK, thank you very much, um, Antonio. And off you go there. I'm going to mute everybody. And Antonio, unmute okay. yourself and yeah, I mean, and so, and away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for and thank you, Terry, for inviting me, and thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, Happy New Year, and it's it's a pleasure to to be here and and to talk about comets. Um, I mean, as, as Paul said, my my research is more about gamma ray bursts and the the transient universe, but um, yeah, uh, because I'm also lecturing in in astronomy in multiple years at college and comets have been one of the topics that I've been lecturing for for many years. Well, I have some knowledge, so I'm no, no huge expert, but I, I know something. So I mean, that could open up a discussion later. So I'm happy to, to chat with you um, about any questions that you may have. So we're going to talk about um, comets. This is a, an image that I took a, a year ago about Neowise. Never polish it because uh, I saw that there there was yeah never ha I was never happy with this this kind of observation that I that I took too many mistakes but it shows a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about we're going to talk about the two tails and we're going to be talking about the dust tail and hopefully you can see my mouse and the dust tail and what happens. Uh, to the dust tail, how it, it behaves, how it shapes. And of course, I'm going to show you some of the brilliant uh, images that we've been seeing of Comet Leonard, especially now after uh, it was very close to the sun and now it has passed perihelion. Um, so just to give you an outline of what the talk is going to be, just um, to make sure everyone knows what a comet is, and then we will be talking about where they're coming from and the role of Jupiter, not only on on where they're, they're, where they're coming from, but also on protecting us. Uh, Jupiter is a, kind of like a big brother uh, to us. Um, then uh, we will talk about the shapes and colors of comets. That's my nature. I love um, astronomy and I love astro astrophotography and I love bringing them together and explaining why things look the way they do. Uh, so I, every time that I have an opportunity, I, I do talk about that. So we'll talk about the shapes and the colors. And then we, why are we interested in studying comets? What can we learn from them? And what can they tell us about us, uh, our present, uh, you know, what, what, what we, you know, why are we here and why is Earth the way it is in terms of water, for example. And um, then I'll talk about comets as seeds of the new solar system, of, of new solar systems. And I'll finish with a seasonal uh, kind of like topic, you know, from a scientific point of view, what do we think it happened about 20, 21 years ago, you know, that famous comet and the, the wise men or the three kings that uh, they're very famous. That's actually the main holiday in Spain where kids get presents and it's tonight. So the three kings are coming tonight. So it's a kind of nice way of, of finishing this talk. Um, so what are comets? So comets is what we call uh, what we call dirty snowballs or icy planetesimals to be a little more scientific. Planetesimals is a, a, tin, a teeny tiny rock um, that form early on in the in the solar system. So that already tells you that they're very interesting because they they are the building blocks of the solar system. Somehow these little rocks. Um, 
didn't gather uh, and and grew bigger and didn't gather into you know with us to become to make earth bigger or to make mercury bigger or venus or any of the terrestrial planets or any of the gas giant planets too they also have a little core at the center no they just remain there and they remain untouched especially those that lie really far away from the sun they're very untouched and they are kind of like you know, a, a way of looking into the past, looking into how the solar system looked when it was forming. So that's that's already uh, a reason to study them and to to pay attention to them. Um, and they are they are dirty as no, as no ball because it's, in terms of density, it's kind of like the density of ice, water ice, although they are not pure water ice. They have other elements. They have other molecules that we'll see will give them some of the bright colors that, that we know. When they are far from the sun, they're very difficult to see. They are just a piece of rock, kind of like an asteroid, you could you could say. And it's only when they get closer to the sun when they start displaying this beautiful um, show with the two tails that uh, characterize them very, very, uh, very much. Now, depending on the composition, when this uh, uh, sublimation, when this turning the ice on the surface of the comet into gas. When is that happen uh, happening? It depends. So for certain comets, it would happen at 20, 30 astronomical units, as far as that. And for other comets, they will not start sublimating until five, three uh, astronomical units. So it, sometimes it will be a little bit easier to identify a comet really far away because it will start having a little glow around the center. And sometimes we will have to wait a little bit closer until we fully discover them. The tails, as you can see on the on the image, they are pointing away from the sun. We'll go much deeper into that, but in general, they point away from the sun as the comet moves around the sun. And there are two types: the the ion tail, which is normally very characterized by a blue color and it's straight line, pretty much, um, and that is is in that direction. And it's it interacts very much with the solar wind. It, it's it's made of charged particles and that's going to make it uh, interacting with the magnetic field that is generated or that is transported within the solar wind so essentially the solar wind is blowing it uh, blowing it away and you can see that it's exactly pointing opposite to the direction of the sun and the, that's a characteristic of the ion tail always pointing away and then we have the dust tail, which is made of dust, dust particle that could be of different density, that could be of different size. And depending on that, it will, it will be playing, and we'll go into this a little more in, into detail, with the sunlight and with the solar winds. And that is what it will give it the, the shape, the particular shape that that comet will have in, the, in terms of dust tail. Uh, in terms of size, uh, one thing that I always say first is the length of the of the ion tail. If you look at that 1.5 10 to the 8 kilometers, that is one astronomical unit. That is 150 million kilometers. So the ion tail can be huge, huge. Now, normally we don't see we don't see the full length of it. It, it gets brighter closer to the to the core of the comet, but it can be very very long. And uh, in terms of the dust tail right away, right after it's forming, right after the nucleus of the comet, it's already spanned or it can span a million kilometers. And then it keeps getting wider and wider, depending again uh, on the density and the size of the particles that have been ejected from, from the comet. In terms of the size, the comet will be about 10 kilometers. There are, a few, there are a few that are smaller, there are a few that are a little bit bigger. And normally seeing the comet itself, though the nucleus of the comet itself, it's really, really difficult uh, because it's surrounded by what we call the coma. Uh, so for example, one of the reasons we wanted to send the Rosetta mission, um, there were multiple reasons, but one of them is it was to study properly a comet where we could see what was happening at the nucleus as it was passing through around the sun uh, through the perihelion, the, the part where it's closest to the sun and where the comet is going to be more active. It's very difficult to see when, when they are close to Earth, normally they are already quite bright and they are already outbursting and sublimating a lot. So it's it's difficult to study what's going on really at the surface of the nucleus. Is it something like in Armageddon, where if you put a human there, you know, like it's just going to go uh, ejected into space? Is it a very explosive event? Or is it more of a mild uh, thing where the surface su suffers changes, but not super dramatic changes? That was something that we were really interested in knowing. And the only way to do it is to fly by around a, a comet and, and observe it up close. Where, where are they coming from? 
where, what, what is the, their origin? Well, in that case, we have two different types of comets. We have the long period comets that you see on the left, and they have orbital periods of thousands to millions of years. These are the comets like Comet Leonard. It's never gonna come back. Pretty much they're a one-off. Some of them, they do come back. You know, there's a, there's a debate on Comet Leonard. Mo most of scientists believe that it just, it, it came from what is, was it was 3000 astronomical units, but the current speed at which it has, even, if, even though it's gonna slow down, it will never come back. It will just, it's a hyperbolic uh, uh, trajectory. Some of the things that it will eventually slow down enough um, that it will, it would have an affiliate that will be around again, 3000, 4000 astronomical units. But uh, essentially, you know, with a comet of that, even though Comet Leonard is traveling really, really fast, it's one of the fastest that we have, we have seen recently. Um, you know, 3,000 astronomical units, 4,000 astronomical units, it takes, it takes time to do that. Um, the curious thing about them, also, if we were to look at the solar system edge on, is that they have high orbit, uh, high inclinations in their orbits. You can see them, that they, all, they can come, they come from every direction. Now, if we look at short period comets, besides having periods of just 100 years or, or less, we see that the, the, their inclinations are much smaller, they are more, much more similar to the normal planets. And um, so the origin of long period comets and short period comets, uh, that was the first indication that they had to be different. Now, we know of the Kuiper belt, we know Pluto is one of the first objects within the Kuiper belt. And the Kuiper belt is kind of like um, a massive version of the asteroid belt, you know, but it's much farther out, it's farther than, than Neptune, and it stands a huge amount of distance, and there's loads and loads of objects, of course, because it, it covers so much, so much distance, the, the average distance between, uh, or it covers so much area, the average distance between um, objects in the Kuiper belt is huge, it's humongous, so we could easily travel through the Kuiper belt, but there's a reservoir of a lot of objects, and so we can detect and we can see, we have seen it, we have observational evidence that the Kuiper belt exists and, and we know that objects can come from there and uh, then can get trapped by Jupiter. And what I mean by that is look at the, the orbits in yellow, blue, green. If we look at the, the orbits of the short period comets, they, they don't come from, from the Kuiper belt. They don't come from beyond Neptune. By the time we see them as short period comets, they already have orbits that have an affiliation around Jupiter. So clearly, clearly there's something happening here. If they come from far away, how can they suddenly change and have an orbit like that? And it's, that is what I call the role of Jupiter. They come from far away. And, and by the way, just an FYI, you can see Halley on both sides because Halley doesn't fit here because its period is too short, but it doesn't fit on this one because its inclination is too, too, too high. So Halley is that comet that is, you know, it's, it's one, of, one of a kind. So let's, let's leave it alone. But, uh, and also you can see the orbit is, is way beyond Saturn and everything. So it's just one of a kind. But uh, most of short period comets, you see, they, they have affiliates around the orbit of Jupiter, a little bit farther, a little bit inner. And that is, they came from the Kuiper Belt, they were trapped by Jupiter, Jupiter changed the original orbit, and then they started finding a stable orbit. By the time we see them now, they have now a stable orbit. And that stable orbit has a shorter period and a shorter uh, shorter size in, in that sense. And, and we can see that that, that that has happened many, many, many times. And that is because Jupiter is that big. Now, not only Jupiter has a role on grabbing this short period comet, but the formation of the Kuiper belt. We believe that when the solar system was formed, uh, Jupiter formed much closer to the sun, something about almost two astronomical units, 1.7 astronomical units. To give you an idea, Mars is at 1.5. So Mars and Jupiter were, well, Mars probably was also a little bit closer to the sun, but literally Jupiter was more or less at the distance at which Mars is today. And it had to travel, it migrated all the way to the 5.2 astronomical units that it, it, we can find it today. So in that movement, it, it acted as a, like a, like a, like a, like a brush. It started brushing, I was gonna say vacuum cleaner, but it's actually the opposite. It brushed 
and pushed everything outwards. Not only we have the migration of Jupiter, but we also know that Neptune and Saturn, Uranus, they also did a little bit of migration. So all the massive planets, but especially Jupiter, as they moved out, they pushed the debris of the formation of the solar system, those planetesimals that couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, attach to each other to build something bigger, it, they pushed them out. And in the case of the Kuiper Belt, they just pushed them out in, in the same plane at which all the planets orbit. So in that case, when an object from the Kuiper Belt comes inside, the inclination is very similar to the to the rest of the planets because the Kuiper Belt, even though it has a thickness, it pretty much covers the same plane as the as the planets. But on that movement, we can also see and speculate if you prefer, we can see that some objects could have been pushed up, some objects could have pushed down and in any possible inclination. So there's no reason why, you know, that should not happen. Some of them or a lot of them would have pushed away in the same trajectory, just following the same plane, but any other inclination is possible. And we can do modeling of that. And we can see that that is, that is, that is visible. And that will create what you see there as the Oort cloud. Now the Oort cloud is massive. It extends up to 30,000 astronomical units. It might have trillions of objects or even more, but it's so massive, it's so big. It's a bubble around the solar system, so, so big that the distance between objects is massive. The objects are small, so we don't have direct uh, evidence of the Oort cloud. The only evidence that we can gather is that the long period comets, they come from any direction. So there has to be a seed of objects that allow us to have these comets coming in from up, from down, from left and right, not just the plane as we, we see as the short period comet. So, it's a theoretical, it's a proposed, it's a hypothesis in the case, a model that suggests we are surrounded by this bubble of, of debris from the solar system. Um, but the only way we could pretty much see it probably if it's if we were going outside and we could zoom out and see and see them as, as a whole, gather them together from, from our, our visible point of view. Um, but you know, uh, so far, you know, it's it's working well to get to get this long period comments. Another way, but we, we're not going to be alive, uh, another way to prove it is that, that the Oort cloud exists is in about 10, 20, 30,000 years uh, into, into the future. Well, that will be the beginning. Probably by the time we see the, the objects coming in, we'll, we might need another 20, 30,000 years. But these are the, the nearby stars that we have. Um, and Proxima Centauri, Alpha Centauri, they are the, the nearest stars today that, that we have, but that's not going to be always the same. Uh, we have stars like Barnard Star that are traveling really fast from our point of view, and at some point they're going to be quite close. Uh, we can see Gliese, no, which one is Ross 248, at some point in 35,000 years, they will be much a little bit closer. But anyway, so this is where they are today, and in the future they will be, uh, you know, a little bit, you know, just about just about three light years. So it, they will be one light year closer than what they are now. The Oort cloud, I mean, here it says order border of the Oort cloud there, but they, we know that there are objects almost, almost to two astronomical, uh, two uh, light years, even two light years. So it, we know that the order part of the Oort cloud is, is a low dense region of, of bodies. And the presence of these stars will eventually start sending us, so it will act like Jupiter, did early on, these stars will start pushing some of, there will be some gravitational perturbation on, on the bodies and it, they will start being pushed into the inner part of the solar system. So the, in about 30, 40, 50,000 years, we expect to see some kind of bomba oh, sorry, bombardment of, of objects from the Oort cloud, which eventually, you know, if someone is alive and can actually observe that, could prove in a different way that the Oort cloud exists. If there's no bombardment of, of, of bodies, you know, someone will have to come up with a new theory of, of to explain the long period comets. Here I, I have a little diagram of what uh, Jupiter does to some of the objects that come from the Kuiper belt. So 
you have the original orbit that is the dashed line. That's what the object would have done. But due to the, the presence of Jupiter, eventually it kind of tries to gravitationally pull it. Now, at that moment, the comet is traveling a little bit too fast. So Jupiter cannot just grab it and keep it for itself. It does that sometimes. We saw that with Comet Shoemaker-Levy. Jupiter, you know, the comet passed by nearby Jupiter. It passed too close to Jupiter and at speed that wasn't fast enough. And eventually Jupiter grabbed it, Jupiter destroyed it, and we got beautiful fireworks that allowed us to study the planet's atmosphere and also the composition of the comet. So it was it was great from, from a scientific point of view. But sometimes the, the speed of the comet is fast enough that Jupiter just modify the orbit and turns into this solid line around here becoming a short period comet. And at the same time, that presence of Jupiter there will make it will create a shield an, an, a natural shield for Earth. Jupiter um, for an object, let's say for an object to get into here and to hit us and to be able to hit Earth, um, the chances are that if we can if it can escape uh, the gravitational pull of Jupiter, it will have also an opportunity to escape the solar system altogether. Essentially, if, if it's not gonna be um, modified by Jupiter and grabbed by Jupiter, the chances is that it will fly by around the sun once and never again. Now, we could be hit that one time, but more, most of the, the, the probability says that it will be very difficult to have a one-off shot. Now, for an object to be trapped is very unlikely, especially now with the solar system the way it is, it's a little bit more unlikely to get a new short period comet with a stable orbit that will cross the orbit of Earth and could eventually hit us. So in, th in, in that sense, any new object that is coming from outside and is pass passing by near Ju uh, Jupiter it will most likely either be grabbed by Jupiter or fly by and escape the solar system altogether. So we should thank Jupiter for being the, the, the planet that it is, the science that it is with its gravitational pull and to be defending Earth. It's the natural defender, let's say. And uh, sometimes not only Jupiter gets uh, to attract comets, we also see that sometimes some of these comets pass really, really close to the sun. Now, this was Comet Ison in 2013, and it was suggested that as it was approaching uh, the sun, um, all the studies were suggesting that it was going to be the comet of the century or the millennia. It was going to be really bright. And you can see from the SOFO data that it was already getting really bright early on. Now, at that moment, it was passing a little bit far away from Earth. So what we were hoping is after the perihelion, when it was coming this way, that is when it was going to get closer to Earth. That's when it was going to be favoring uh, the visibility for, for Earth. You know, a comet can be really bright when it gets around the sun. But if, if Earth is at the other side of its orbit, the distance is too big and we're not going to we're not going to be able to, to see it nicely. For a comet to look like Comet Leonard, not only has to go around the sun and get close to the sun, but also has to be close to us at certain distance. Uh, so in this case, Comet Ison, it, it was going to be good coming out. But as soon as as soon as came out, we all knew that it was going to get really, really close, really, really close, stupidly close. So chances of it being destroyed, it was high, but we were all hoping. And I remember being online watching this live as Soho was sending the data. And for a little while to protect the mission against the sun, the brightness of the sun, we, we have this coronagraph, so we couldn't see it. So for, a, for an hour or so, we were just waiting there, what would happen? And we, we saw this and you can see there is, the core is very diffuse. There is no tail. There is just a diffuse kind of like arrow. And as the comet moves away, it keeps dissipating and dissipating. So the comet didn't survive. We saw it live. Also, you can see that the sun in 2013 was very active. So that probably also helped on the, the destruction of, um, of the comet. There was a huge solar wind, huge coronal mass ejections, huge uh, activity going on. Um, and the comet, again, passed by really, really close. We can see here a little bit of the of the the, uh, uh, the time lapse of that of that pass by, really bright, still kind of like very 
you know, in, in terms of integrity in a, in a whole, and then after the pass by, you know, completely diffuse. Uh, so comets not only disintegrate when they pass by near Jupiter, uh, um, we have seen that. And actually, I think a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we have seen another comet uh, impacting on Jupiter, uh, but we have seen it also on, on the sun. And in some cases, like Comet Linear, uh, not only it breaks once, but it breaks twice and uh, it keeps moving around. So this comet um, in, in 2000, it broke in two parts. And then in 2006, it broke into more little pieces. Now, these little pieces are all moving at the same speed, like carrying the same momentum. Um, now, of course, the comet is not as bright, uh, bright as it was because there's not a lot of mass, but the com you know, there's still a, a nice nucleus um, intact. And, and then there's a nice, nice debris. So in, in some cases, you know, the comets might get close, but not too close in the sense that it can, they can break, but they can still survive. This comet has a very short period. So every 5.4 years is, is orbiting Earth, sorry, orbiting the sun. So we keep monitoring as far as I know, uh, on the last few passages, the comet hasn't been, you know, hasn't broken more. Uh, it's more or less intact, although as far as I know, it's losing some of this little, every time it passes by, some of these little guys, you know, just don't survive anymore. But as far as I know, it, it, there's no more fragments. But it, yeah, it's a nice comet to, to keep an eye and, and try to observe and, and to study its behavior. Let's let's go and, and, and talk about the shapes and colors of comets. So let's talk about first the you know like let's let's give a, a, a sample of, of what we can see and just three little examples. So we have comet Leonard, and uh, just to show that the tail is very straight, very straight. And I'll, I'll I'll talk about that. The dust tail is very straight. Now we have comet McNaught that had a tail that was extremely curved. And um, like I remember when I was a kid, Comet, Comet Hale Bob was one of one that showed a very curved tail and everyone was telling me, oh, no, that's not that common. Uh, but then Comet McNaught, it just the tail was extremely long and extremely curved. Um, Comet uh, Neowise kind of like had the rather than being curved, what it, it was, it got really wide uh, later on. And then we have Comet like uh, 46 Virtanen that it didn't kind of, it had a beautiful green glow, but it didn't really display a, a tail on it on its own. Uh, we never saw it properly with a tail. Now, if you were to zoom in into, into Comet uh, Birtan, and eventually after a while, we could see the next to the, the core, there was a little teeny tiny tail. Uh, but I remember, and I, I got a little bit angry about that. And um, I remember with Burton and there were a discussion of people saying, why is not why is the comet not developing a dust tail? Why is the comet not developing a dust tail? And what we have to realize is that comets do develop a tail. It's just the perspective. You know, comets are traveling around the solar system and they're traveling in an orbit around the sun. So we will see them depending on our position and how we are moving with respect to the sun and how they are coming in and moving around the sun. We will see them with different perspectives. So if I, if my hand, if my fist was the core of the comet and I would be pointing my arm extreme, uh, opposite to the camera, you will not see my arm. It's not that I, I, you know, I have a fist without an arm. No, it's just you cannot see it. Now, if I turned a little bit like that, you can see a little bit of my arm, but again, you don't see the full display of my arm. It's only if I put it completely perpendicular to you that you see the core, the, my fist, and you see my whole arm. And that's what's happening in, in a lot of comets, especially what well, happens in all, of com in all the comets. We need to think about it of the solar system in 3D, not just the 2D. But that's essentially what happened with Comet, comet Virtanen. We were seeing it facing to us. It was essentially kind of like coming to us. And eventually later on, it's, we, we turn or it turned. One of the two started turning a little bit. And we started to see a little bit of the tail if you were to, to have uh, a lot of magnification. Before we go into the, the other shapes of the comets, let's talk about the colors. So you can see a beautiful green, and that's very characteristic. I have here a few images of, of Comet Leonard that I got from, from Michael Jagger. Um, 
and you can see that it, it's also very green on the on the on the coma, like the coma is also very green. Then the rest is a little bit saturated over here, so we we lose a little bit of the color. But we can see that the the tail, uh, so the coma is very very green. And now green is one of the most common colors in, in comets. Not all of them, but it's the most common color. And what we have to realize is that there are elements on the surface that are sublimating with the ice. So there, there's ice and it's turning into gas. Uh, and that is due to the heat. And by doing that, uh, the molecules that are within the dirty ice, um, they're going to get ionized. So the electrons are going to either be redistributed or they're going to be lost and uh, there are free electrons in, floating around and then they will have to grab them. So the molecules are going to destabilize. We could call it recombination or we can call it uh, different. There are different possibilities. In this case, there are two molecules that will give us the green color. So uh, C2, so two, two atoms of, of carbon together, or CN, okay, carbon nitrogen together. That, those ones, when they, they, re, they have recombination or they, they, they ionize, the molecule ionize, and then they re restabilize by regrabbing some of the electrons. When that happens, they will glow in green. Essentially, just to give you a, a general perspective, every time you see something glowing, something like this is happening. When we look into hydro, uh, into the Horsehead Nebula, for example, when look, we look at it and we see that beautiful red, the same process is happening. We have radiation from, from massive stars, blue massive stars um, that are uh, messing up with the electrons in the hydrogen that is, is, ma is making that, all that red part that you see is, is hydrogen. And eventually there's a recombination of the hydrogen. Uh, the hydrogen becomes a little more stable. It goes, uh, the electron goes from the third level to the second level. And by doing that, it emits in red. Auroras, when we see the green color of the auroras in, this, in the night sky or the red color of auroras in the night sky, that's again, again the, the same process. Uh, the oxygen and the nitrogen in our atmosphere gets ionized and then it recombines to become, again, as stable as it can be. And by doing that, it emits in those beautiful reds and those beautiful greens. When a meteor hits the atmosphere and we see a green flash, the same, the heat produced by the, by the meteor, it's ionizing the, uh, the elements of the atmosphere. Green is typically the oxygen, red is typically the nitrogen. And we can see what, what uh, with that actually, we can also get a sense of how high uh, the what the explosion or disintegration happens. The, uh, the afterglow that we, uh, uh, the air glow, sorry, the air glow that we see sometimes in very dark nights after a really, uh, let's say, bright day, uh, there's a residue of radiation in the atmosphere. If you go to an observatory with portal zero, portal one, uh, uh, and during the nighttime, you might see this air glow, sometimes red, sometimes green. And it's, a, it's very similar to the aurora, but in a, a much lower effect. But again, it's always a molecule Losing electrons, gaining, you know, recombining, and and doing something there, ionizing, and and then trying to get stable. In the comets, we have the same effect. Now, as far as I know, there's also a possibility of a comet being blue. And um, the most famous blue comet was uh, Hale Bob. In that case, we're talking about. Uh, carbon monoxide, uh, so it had a lot of carbon monoxide. That was the, its primary element. So depending on, the, the comets might have a lot of elements and there might be a lot of colors, you know, but there's always one or two that are the primary ones. In this case, it's probably C2 or Cn, I, either either molecule will be the primary. In the case of hale -Bob, it was carbon monoxide, for example. The ion tail, no, the ion tail is normally, it's very, it's, it's, it's charged particles. And, and uh, when charged particles interact with the solar wind, the typical color will be just, just blue. Um, so here uh, we can see actually, I, I chose this too, uh, because a lot of people were, I remember, contacted me a, a few days ago and were like, oh, is the, is the tail of, of uh, Leonard becoming blue and I said no it's just that is the ion tail and they were like no but it's a straight line I said well it's a perspective so again we we need to think about the perspective comets have two tails but sometimes depending on the orientation they can be superimposed and we can see a few days earlier or later we can see that that 
we have the dust tail, which is the white one in this case, and the ion tail in blue. And, and we can see it so just on the top image, image, just one was on top of the other and, <laughs> and the other one. And just, so again, perspective is very, very important. Now, we one thing that we uh, Comer Leonard has allowed us to, to see, and, and, and Michael has been amazing on that, is a lot of what's going on around here with the dust. And uh, there's a lot of um, structure. Normally, Magnot showed us some structure too. Neowise also had some structure, but so it shows that the, the dust doesn't just go there and form a cloud. There's, there's stuff going on. And again, all that stuff is dep depends on the density and the size of the dust particle. And this is a very straight line uh, comet in terms of dust. It opens up, um, it opens up, but it's a very straight line. Uh, so now why am I showing you our solar sail? Um, just to give you a, a, a little brief uh, information about what the sun and what a photon can do. Photons carry momentum current energy. And by doing that, they, they behave in some way like the, the wind. Uh, if you have a sail and there's wind, the boat is pushed away. And photons can actually push particles away. If the size and the density of the particle is correct, that particle can be blown away by photons hitting on it. Um, now, if the particle is too big, then like, for example, Earth is being bombarded all the time by photons. Now, Earth is big enough that we just get a little bit of like, let's say a little bit of a drag, if you want a little bit of like, okay, if, it, if it's pushing us against our motion, it's a little bit of a drag. If it's pushing us in our direction, it will be a little bit of push, but it's negligible. In the case of, a, of the dust of a comet, that is actually quite important. And it's gonna give us that, the different shapes and the different sizes of, of the tail, of the dust tail will depend on, on, on all of that. In terms of humans, what can we do? Well, we are proposing uh, to travel, especially beyond the solar system, uh, using the solar sail technology. So if you have um, a sail that is very thin and a, of, of, a, of a material very, very uh, reflective, uh, and you, have a, you use a light source, technically would be better to have a laser on the spaceship. Otherwise, as you move away from the light source, you, you, you get less momentum. But if you have a laser or something, a light source that is is push is, is sending photons to that reflected surface, you're going to be able to accelerate. And you can get really, really high speeds. Now, the problem is that you accelerate very, very slow. This technology has been now demonstrated in space. It has happened. And... Uh, well, we haven't we haven't used it yet. I mean, this is the size of a of a soccer field, if I remember well. So it's, it's a massive solar solar cell. But it shows that yes, photons carry momentum. Photons can can push things. And in the in the case of a comet, we can think of three possibilities: a dust path A that is pushed away, and that is we have the sun here, the ion tail. As I said, we don't have to worry too much about it. It interacts with the solar wind. Sorry, it's, yeah, with solar wind, it's about charged particles. It's always opposite to the sun, always opposite to the sun. Now, in the case of the dust tail, if the particles are of a density right, uh, the right density and the right size for the photons to push it, they're going to have a, a. They're going to be pushed away. If they are too heavy the photons are not going to be able to push them all away and the gravity of the sun is going to win. And that's going to give us path C. So we're going to have a curve, a curvature towards the sun. And in the case of B, well, you can guess, you know, it's when the particle is neither too big nor too small and the density is just about right. So both gravity, the gravitational pull, uh, pull from the sun and the, uh, and the, and the, the push that the photons create are equal. So that is the equilibrium. So by, by seeing a lot of a structure in the tail, we can see that there are a lot of different particles being currently ejected on, on Comet Leonard of different size, of different density, and each of them is trying to follow a path like this. Of course, overall, what we see is that the comet is moving and all the particles are being ejected over and over and over in every single part of the, the orbit of the comet. So what we see is the convolution of the different paths that that the different particles have followed. So in the case of in the case of um, Comet Leonard, if we see a straight line 
what we can see that uh, we could then start thinking, oh, there will be more of path C or more of path B or more of path A within the structure. In the case of uh, Leonard, for example, we see it's a straight line. So we cannot have a lot of path A type of particles because they will be pushed away and they're gonna give us a beautiful cur curvature. The more we have of path A, the more we're gonna be curving away from the sun and towards the way towards the, the path that we came from. So we're gonna be super curved. If we don't have a lot of those particles, we're gonna be more straight. Uh, technically, uh, so in that, you know, technically, for example, then Comet Magnot had a lot of path A particles. Uh, those were very pushed away by photons and Comet Leonard, well, not, not that many, more about B and C and still a lot of a lot of structure within it. Now what we what happens now with Comet Leonard and this was the uh, uh, the astronomy picture of the day from January 3rd by Jan, um, we see that the tail now has been so long, so so long that it has broken. So the dust tail can also interact with the solar wind. And in this case, the tail that covers a huge amount, I've, I've never seen something like this. Now, it's, it's dispersing and it's interacting too much with the solar wind that is creating all this wiggling around from here. So let's say that the normal tail will be all the way here. And from this moment on, that disruption that we've seen from before the new years, I would say we, we started seeing that effect, but then we, we've seen it even more. It, it's caused by the interaction of the tail with the solar wind. So there's a, an interaction there. And then of course, then we have a, a different, we have an extra component that wasn't explained on this, that is gonna disrupt the path uh, the, the path that we were we were that I was talking about and you can see that it's, it keeps trying to be straight line for a little bit more because that's you know okay the solar wind is pushing me in here and there but overall um, the particles are of certain path and um, but no I mean later on it just just goes goes nuts so a very very interesting comment in the this comment Leonard why study 67b and, and what the Rosetta mission there are multiple questions that we want to, to, to ask. Well, first, I, I mentioned it early on, comets are the building blocks of the solar system. So they can give us a lot of information of how the solar system formed and what was the, the, the raw material that was there and how it, you know, how everything started. And there's another thing that we want to find out, how did Earth got water? How did we get water? Uh, and there's multiple possibilities. We think asteroids could have been the seed of water on Earth. We think comets could have been the seed of, uh, of water. So we want to study that. And by, by the way to study it is by looking at the ratio between deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, and hydrogen. The ratio between those two is going to, uh, we know what the ratio is on Earth. And whoever, whatever object out there has more or less the same radio is very likely that they will be the original source to give us to give us the to give us water and to, to see to put the seed of water on earth and we know water is fundamental for life then to evolve to the point at which we we have evolved now interestingly 67b was not the original comet that um, that scientists the ESA scientists proposed now the problem was that the, the mission as always not as much as, as James Webb but <laughs> definitely nothing like James Webb but the mission was was delayed due to certain problems and the comet the original comet was missed um, so it wasn't actually by that much but the mission missed the original comet so as always when we propose a mission to ESA everything is, is doubled and triple checked and and of course there were multiple candidates so 67p was one of those secondary candidates and um, good enough in principle we thought um, what happens is, so this is 67B, origin, uh, right away as we, we saw the first image, we were very intrigued at the fact that it wasn't just a single body. It was kind of like, um, like a duck with a head, a neck, and a body. And that was a little bit un, unexpected, you know, as, and, and it has to, you know, this has puzzled now scientists even more after uh, New Horizons got and went to uh, the Kuiper Belt and, and got an image of um, Ultima Thule and realized that it was, well, in that case, it was like a snowman, two balls attached together. So now when we, you know, we, we have to rethink, is, is it very likely that 
these planetesimals, these little bodies that form early on, you know, attached to each other. And is it common to see them like that, two big guys attached and then traveling for the rest of history together? We thought that maybe were the, the common scenario would have been one. And then maybe some cases seen two together or maybe three. But the, cha- the, 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 the fact that we have two images of two very up, up close and both of them are at least two or three parts together it means that maybe that's more more plausible for for um 67p we planned it very well we started when the comet was far out from the sun not very active just miles so we could study um the the, the nucleus when it was not doing anything we could take a lot of really nice photographs of its surface remember we want to see also what happens when we get here, is it very explosive? Is it just mild? Um, does the surface change dramatically? Again, like Armageddon, you know, we get jets from the surface and, you know, it breaks apart. And we know it cannot be like that because, because comets live for, for, for millennia. So it cannot be super dramatic, super explosive, but we wanted to know, does the surface change too much? And so we managed to observe it at different, what we call different zones of activity and then back again, until until it was quiet so we could study how it was before during and after and it was very interesting that during the perihelion the the comet got so bright so so bright that the Rosetta mission wasn't able to to find its place around the comet so the the Rosetta mission used a background scar background stars to know okay the comet is there and I need to go in this direction just for navigation but it got so bright that it couldn't see the stars in the background so at some point we had to pull away from the comet see okay the oh, these are the stars okay now back again my comet my object is there i can keep and we had to do that for a little while because although you know like it couldn't it couldn't just it didn't know what to do at some point the, the mission these are some of the photos from the perihelion so when the comet was very, very active and we can see that there's some flames uh, like, of course, we were so close that we were able, even though from our point of view at this point, we would have seen already the coal mass surrounding the core and we would have seen the tail. We were close enough that we could even see what region part especially was was sublimating most and what, how the process was happening. Very interestingly, so again, there was there were some very pinpoint regions doing something, but overall, it was a constant around the surface uh, activity. It was like a glow. It was kind of like sublimation across. Um, it was it was something like like if you have um, if you're in a lake. I just remember now uh, the Wicklow in Wicklow, uh, the lake over there. Uh, in a very cold night, you might start seeing uh, if you know you might start seeing fog forming around it, and you see it, you know, that it forms across the lake because it's really cold and the condition is formed, kind of like that. You know, overall there was kind of like a foggy part of dust and gas around the the comet. It wasn't very explosive in individual. You know, it wasn't really like atomic bombs in, 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 in little regions, but it was very bright and very, very active for, for a long, long time. And if we, this, this is not on the surface, I know we have a lander, but this is a video of, of a very zooming part of the comet during a, a very close f- uh, flyby. And what we can see is that the surface itself is surrounded like a, like a snowstorm. It's almost like a snowstorm with a lot of particles floating around, but uh, we see a cliff and right outside the cliff, the sun was illuminating really, really uh, uh, was illuminated a lot. So there was a little more violent events happening, but overall uh, that stone that you can see there, here, that stone, it didn't, it didn't notice anything. And uh, Chances are that that stone before the the flyby, before the perihelion, it was there. And after the perihelion, it was there and it didn't change. So we know that we potentially, let's say in an imaginary world, we could land on a comet, be in a specific part of the comet and nothing happened to us. It could, it could happen. That that is that is a possibility. It's not that the whole surface is just going to go kaboom. But, uh, you know, it's... uh, uh, for me, this this video is, it reminds me of a you know Ophelia that storm that we had here in Ireland uh, was with a, was it Ophelia I can't remember now but it, it was that or Emma it was a storm Emma I think the one with the, with the snow 
that it was it was very heavy and you could see it's you know it was, it was very heavy falling and that's that's the, the feeling that, that i had when i when i saw this overall we have actually a lot of images and um, so 2015 2016 on the top 2014 2016 so that's before and after the perihelion uh, there's also 2014 2015 so if we go here 2014 and 2015 it would be around here but 2016 will be after so anything that you see 2016 like this too everything over here is 2016 so everything would be before and after so we can see for example uh, a moving boulder so that boulder due to activity it was moved around the surface but it wasn't destroyed or anything so probably it was close to some activity jet or something but it wasn't blown away it wasn't pushed away and, and we can see um so uh, some features appearing in the surface um erosion uh, ripples evolution but they're still there so it's it's not a huge dramatic effect that's that's one of the things that we we, we kind of like learned textures changes yeah, a, a few of them. And then the other thing that we wanted to study, we wanted to land on the, on the comet. Um, and it did work, but not as, as much as we, we thought. So we failed at predicting the density. We've never done it. So how can you know? We failed at predicting the exact density of the surface. Um, and then there were, I, I would say that there's, there were some also some technological challenges there. But we landed, we threw the, the Philae mission and we can see the footprints of the fillet, but it, the harpoons didn't grab properly. So it just, just bounced back. And now the comet has its own gravity and that's a good thing, but of course it's more gravitational pull. And then it's very irregular and it's rotating quite fast. So by the time it, it bounced back, what we, from our point of view, from the point of view of, of the Rosetta mission, we saw that the, the fillet was just going into, into space, pretty much. The comet was rotating. And eventually, if let's say if the comet would have been tilted in a different way and there was no land, fillet would have just been lost. But luckily enough, there was a little bit of land coming up. Uh, right after that, and, and it landed, and this was this was the photo that that we we took uh, the very, as as it landed. Now we knew that we were close to a wall because you know it's very obvious, and we knew that we weren't we weren't getting as much sunlight as we we wanted, and so the scientists started doing as much experiments as they could before the battery would run out because we knew that we weren't going to be able to recharge it. They did about 60% of the experiment. So it was a great success. And we now, now we know that we can land, we can grab ourselves. And even though we weren't able to do 100% what we wanted, we, we were able to, to do a lot and, and to study a lot of things. And about the surface of the of the of the comet from the comet itself and send it to Rosetta to, to then send us the information. Now, just about, so this was uh, just about the, by the end of the mission, uh, the way the mission ended was crashing it into the comet. That's a, a nice way that we, we tend to do that. We have crashed things into the moon. We have crashed things into Saturn. We have crashed things into comets. It's the, the nice way of killing something and learn something from that crash. And, but right before that, there was a race to find where exactly was Philae. We wanted to know there was a feeling of, we want to know where it is. And just, I think it was two days before the end, um, we got this beautiful image there underneath that gigantic boulder thingy. That was Philae. And that is the wall that we saw, you know, very, very, very near, very close to, you know, here, there, and that image. It grabbed itself quite well and it stayed there and it's probably still there and it will be for, for the remaining of times. And one thing that we wanted to know, as I said, is that, do comets like 67P, do they work as the seeds of water for, for Earth? And 67P, uh, it's, it's in terms of inclination, in terms of orbit, um, it, so the, the, the period of its orbit, it's what it would be called a Jupiter-type comet. Jupiter-type comet is one of those comets that came from the Kuiper belt that then were trapped by Jupiter and have a short period comet. And that's what we thought. And when we measure the DH ratio, we get a, a value that is extremely, extremely high. So in terms of 67P, no, a comet like 67P will not be responsible for us to for having water. But interestingly, we know kind of like 
some measurements, this one is more of an upper limit, not an actual measurement, but this one is an, a measurement of a well-known Jupiter family comet. And the value is much closer to what the value of Earth. So this now it's given us an idea that 67P might not be exactly a Jupiter, a Jupiter family comet. It might be a, a comet that looks like a Jupiter family comet, but actually might have, have a different origin. It's okay to think, for example, that a comet from the Oort cloud could come in into the inner part of the solar system with a zero inclination. The Oort cloud surround us uh, as a whole. So it is possible to come on any direction, even the direction of the plane. So we don't know actually the origin of 67b, and we don't know if it's a true representation of Jupiter family comets. We know that objects in the Oort cloud have values like this, which are consistent with 67p. And you know, we have measured it for, for other objects in the solar system, and we have measured it for asteroids. And right now, asteroids are the best chance for us. <laughs> but, you know, with not forgetting the true Jupiter family um, comets that, that we have out there. What are the things that comets do? You know, there's a, the, they can be seeds for new solar systems. And what do I mean for that? We have had the visit recently of a, of a, of a comet from another solar system. Uh, we named it Umauma. Uh, and uh, was discovered in 2017 with coming at a huge inclination at a huge speed, so fast that it, it basically meant that it had to come from outside the solar system, way outside, and it had to come, and it would be moving around the sun, and then off it goes, you know, much uh, velocity much greater than the scale velocity. Um, it was also very elongated. So this is the representation of the comet, much elongated than any of the objects that we know within our solar system. So it looks a little bit of alien. I'm not going to say it's a spaceship, as, as some scientists have claimed, because it's just very elongated. It's just, it can be, why not? Um, now, the thing is that in the formation of the solar system, we have kind of like, or of any solar system, we kind of have a little bit of a problem in the, the amount of time that is required to build planets, Earth size, or even Jupiter size. There is, if, if the, the seeds are of, of terrestrial planets, let's say like, Jupiter, uh, like Earth and, and Venus, if the seeds are centimeter size particles that start gathering together and start making it get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That will take a lot of time. Wow, a lot, a lot of time. Much greater than what we can observe now, uh, observing different solar systems forming. We're talking about a few more million years than what we think it has to, you know, everything has to happen in a much shorter amount of time. So we need when a solar system, system is forming, we need objects like, let's say, Uma Uma already there. So they have a high gravitational pull and they start attracting all um, little particles, little planetesimals already. So instead of starting with a centimeter particle that gathers with another centimeter particle and you have two centimeters, you already start with an object of 400 meters long. If you do that, if you add a few of these objects out there, and then everything can happen much faster, and it, it falls well within the, the the amount of time that we 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 observe. We're currently observing in the universe how it's happening, and it apparently is it, apparently there are loads of these objects out there. There there seems to be a lot of this. Um, visitors that keep coming in and into our solar system and keep coming going to all different solar systems. Apparently there now scientists are proposing that there's a, a swarm of these bodies of hundreds of meters long or hundreds of meters big and traveling across stars. And when a new solar system is forming, there will be the objects alongside with the, with the protostar at the center, there will be the objects with the, gravi the greater gravitational pull. So then they will be the main builders of, of, the, of, the, planet, of the planet itself. So it could be that the, the first Lego block or that made Earth is actually not from our solar system. It came from a different part of the of the Milky Way, and then the rest, yes, the rest maybe the rest that did it, uh, it remains. It was part of the of the of the particles that collapsed from the from the nebula that form our solar system. But now we're we're talking about this. These visitors have been 
core to understand how, how solar system can build within a few million years. And to finish, to finish, what do we think in, from a scientific point of view? What do we think it could have happened for these three men to be intrigued about what was happening in the sky and start traveling? Now, there are multiple things, uh, multiple issues. There's uh, calendar changes. Um, we know of uh, people counting years that actually missed some years. So uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to know exactly what was happening, what, what, what did happen. Um, also, we now we celebrate the birth of Jesus on, on the 25th of December, but everything indicates that it was probably more likely between May and August. So if we're going to look into astronomical events, well, we can try to look about the whole year, but it is true that during the, the, the months of May and August, there were a few astronomical events on that period that could have attracted the interest of wise men that were interested in, in, in astronomy, um, or maybe astrology at that, at that time, who knows. So the, the, the Bible says that they followed a star and that that star guided them to, to where Jesus was, was born. Now, if we think that they travel in camels, probably it took them multiple years. So the scientific idea is that it, there were multiple processes, that it wasn't just one single process, that there were multiple. One thing that happened is the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. Uh, that's about 6 BC, so six years before, before Jesus was born. Jupiter and Saturn got really, really close, very similar to what we saw last year. Uh, so that would have attracted them. Now, this was pointing, this happened around, around May, you can see there on the date, and um, towards the east, southeast. So this is telling us that the journey of these wise men had to happen in, towards that direction. They couldn't have gone east to west because they had to, you know, this thing was happening. So if they followed whatever was happening in the sky, they had to be following that direction. So, yeah, that's, that's already something to, to think about. There was some, also a conjunction, I was looking at it the other day, um, there was also a conjunction of Jupiter uh, and Venus, where Jupiter and Venus were really close and they couldn't even distinguish between the, themselves. And again, it happened about 5 BC. So that's two astronomical events that happened around summer, around BC, uh, more or less within the same year, and in the same direction. Then we also have the conjunction of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn lined up and quite close in 5 BC. So again, another thing of bright objects moving in a different direction against the background of stars, and um, that would have pushed them to go in that in that direction. And then recently, because this this a lot of like someone has found that Chinese records of a comet started in Copernicus around 5 BC. And we know that the comet, especially if it's moving decently fast, will move with respect to the background of the stars. Comet, a comet has always been like the favor, the favored um. Uh, idea that that the star that the the wise men followed was a comet and again we believe that not a, a comet by itself wouldn't have been enough probably they wouldn't have had enough time to travel a great distance uh, between 6 bc and 5 bc there were multiple events astronomical events and together together probably probably and um, because again they all happened around the, the same period and maybe they they guided them uh, to where Jesus was was born, but that, that's just to put a little bit of a science into into all this story that that we have experienced now in Christmas, and so that's it for for my talk. Thank you very much for listening, and um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to to answer them. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you very much. That was an absolutely fascinating uh, um, account of the uh, the whole field of comets. Really, actually, I, I've seen a good few myself. Actually, the one that sticks out in my memory as being um, unusual was Comet Holmes of about 2008 or so. Um, and, and that comes back to that thing you were talking about with perspective that that was coming straight at us, like absolutely like that, you know? And, uh, um, and so it just appeared as, as a comet in the middle with a huge circle of, of tail around it, um, which was at one stage, the largest object in the solar system. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that, that was a, a really good one, but uh, thank you for that.